All right, well, hello and welcome. My name is Robert, as you heard, um, and today we'll be talking about writing policies for Kube Warden. Now, we'll go through the agenda first, kind of who I am, talk about what Kube Warden is, um, talk about policies, and then I'm gonna do this slightly different where I'm gonna walk you through how I wrote this policy and then have a kind of a surprise at the end for everybody. So, um, who I am. This is not me. I know you see my last name and everyone thinks this, but I am not Sriracha Sergio. so thank you for pronouncing my last name. Uh, senior Technical Evangelist at SUSE. Uh, my job is to work in the community. I get people excited about our technologies, all being open source, and I get to talk about it. And not only do I get to talk about it, I get to learn it, and then turn around and help others learn it and know it and understand it. You can follow me on Twitter at Robert Cirk if you'd like. Uh, harass me, talk about football technology, all of that. So what is Kube Warden? Well, Kube Warden is a policy engine and its mission is to simplify the policy adoption of policy as code for Kubernetes, right? And it has two main focused of audiences. The first one is the policy developer and we'll be walking through what a policy developer does and we'll talk about it in the demo at the end, what a policy operator is, right? And writing a policy for Cooper, Coop Warden is actually relatively easy and you can bring your own language and it's what makes Coop Warden really kind of cool, right? So if you've ever used OPA, you have access of running that in Coop Warden. Um, Coop Warden has a handful of highlights I wanna talk about and first is our open source hub for existing policies. You can download, you can run them and these are things that we know operators struggled with in the past. We've written some. Other contributors have written some of these policies for us, and they're up on the, our policy hub. And that's hub.kubewarden.io. You can go out there and check it out. But if you have policies that are OPA, written in Rego, you can bring those along. And why I got excited about Kubewarden is I had a use case for WebAssembly. And so I made, it's not often you get a use case that you can say, well, hey, I can actually write this and test it and play with some bleeding edge technologies and have it adopted and used relatively fast and easy with it. So policies. Our policies, um, when we're writing them, are, um, are compiled into a WebAssembly binaries. And these are small compiled for a specific task. We don't recommend doing multiple things in these policies. They have a job, let them do that one job and do it very well. So when we recommend you writing a policy, think about what it is. If it doesn't exist in Policy Hub, check there first, obviously, but then write it yourself, but have it do one job. Don't try to overload it. I've learned the hard way that this is a bad thing and the Kube Warden team will remind you that it's a bad thing. They do quite frequently with me. <coughs> so. If we think how policies work, we have an operator or a developer with their cluster, right? And they want to do a particular operation and Kube Warden kind of stands in there with their policies that they, they have running. And let's say we want to push a pod or push a deployment. It checks and makes sure that everything that you are attempting to do, and you have not only the permissions, but it makes sure that the, the object you're trying to create in Kubernetes is going to, mit to match what the policy states, right? And why that's, that's important? Well, some of the policies out there and some of the demos you'll see, we'll talk about, I don't want you to name your pod something silly, right? Because you, know, you might think it's funny as a developer going like, hey, my pod's name is, I see your butt. But that's not necessarily you know, good for business. So we want to put some rules that you don't put swear words or something silly in there. But we're here to talk about writing our first policy and we're doing it in Rust. And Rust is a unforgiving language. I looked at it a few years ago and it was very painful, but it's come a long way since then. It's relatively easy to install and we'll talk about that. And not only is it easy to install, um, it's easy to get started with, right? The community for Rust is amazing and you can find Discord channels, you can find Rust for specific things and what makes it kind of awesome is We've adopted it for how we're able to write policies. So we're gonna build something. 
and we're going to build a policy. And this is not a real good use case policy for Kubernetes, but in development, I actually had this problem right here um, where I had developers over allocating CPU resources on containers. And I thought, what's bringing this cluster down? What's grinding us to a halt? What are the developers doing beyond their developer workstations to do this? And I, we kind of give them free reign, de it's developed. Um, and then realizing they were over provisioning and it was crushing everything else in there. So I figured, why can't we just write this, right? So that's what I did. So for this demo, that's kind of what we did. So we set up with setup and configuration. First is VS Code. Um, it's, uh, I don't get into the, the war of what, what's the best you know, editor out there or best IDE. I just use this because it's relatively simple. It has a high level of adoption. The Rust extensions, uh, I don't want to say it's a must have, but it's pretty much a Rust have. It, it's, it, uh, I just said Rust have. It's actually a must have. It's, it makes your life a lot easier with syntax. It makes your life a lot easier with some of the formatting. I love using it, so I always recommend it. And if you notice that I have hyperlinks in this deck, I will share this deck as a PDF when I'm done. So if anyone wants it out there in the field, I can show you where you can go get that. Installing is relatively easy. Now it's a curl command. If you don't like the curl command, they actually will go show you how to, uh, rustlang.org will show you how to manually do it. I'm pretty lazy. I use the curl command. I know it's not best practice, but hey, on this work machine, it works. And when you install Rust, you always want to make sure that you do a Rust hyphen capital V, make sure the version's up there, everything works, everything's good. I always recommend it. Let's verify. But we can't really test this. We can, but we want to deploy it. So we'll talk about the deployment later, but we need an environment to do so. So we need some type of Kubernetes. And, and for my example, my demo, I'm going to use Rancher Desktop because, well, if you haven't seen it, it allows me to quickly spin up a local instance of Kubernetes. And if I mess up, I have a reset button that resets it back to normal. It makes everyone's life easier, especially mine. So when I was building this, I can't tell you how many times I, I hit that reset button. You're going to need Helm because, well, that's how we deploy Kube Warden. And you're going to need the Kube, the KWCTO or Kube or Kube Warden control. And this is a CLI that you can download from GitHub. And this is, helps us verify and annotate our policy after we write it. And then that's all you need to install Kube Warden. Now, it does need a cert manager. It's in there. Now, this is right from the uh, Kube Warden documentation. This is the best way. This is how I recommend installing Kube Warden. And it's int done. It takes about 30 seconds to run, depending on your uh, machine size. So cargo install, cargo generate. No time though I recommend that you go out there and natively try to write this on your own. We have a template for you to do, to use, excuse me, and to use it, you're gonna to need to install um, Cargo Generate. Cargo Generate just allows you to run a command, go out to our GitHub, pull our template down, which has our SDK all ready to go. Did I lose it? Wow. Um, and from there, when you create it, you're gonna see two important files in there. You're gonna see librs, settings.rs, those are where we do most of our work in. So first we want to update the settings and we're gonna put a string value out there for CPU limit, right? We want a user to be saying, I wanna give you whatever CPUs allocation that your pod can create uh, your pod can use upon create. So we added that to our struct that's called settings, right? And inside the SDK, we have something that allows us to verify that. We want to make sure that value is there because, well, what's the point of having the policy if that value is not there? And so inside that validate function, you can go in there and say, hey, if this is set to, um, is it, if, if it's an empty string, throw an error. If not, I know it's okay. Now, this is a demo, right? There should be some validation. Don't I want a particular string value? Don't I, like, what if, what if someone puts ASDF? Is that gonna work? 
we'll get to, we'll get to that validation here in a minute. But as good developers that we are, or engineers, we want to make sure we have tests. And we actually stub out a handful of tests in the project when you scaffold out this uh, project to go in there and do such a thing. And that's what we're doing here, is we're making sure that we have the values that we're seeing for settings, right? And it's always good practice to, to do this. So there's a test file at the bottom of the settings when you see it, or, or test section block, excuse me. And that's where you want to update and put those tests. Now, this is not the policy test, but this is just the settings, making sure it has the values that it needs. So, the policy. We have a, a pod match. What the scaffolding has, it's a, a little bit it's a, it's a little bit much, so I stripped it out to what we need, right? Here's the pod, here's an error, go with that. But we want the policy to have a response. So I create, we have a struct, or an enum, excuse me, and it's either accepting the results or rejecting it with a reason why we rejected it. And once again, we want to validate and so we have a validate pod function that I added to this, right? And so in here, what I'm saying is, give me a pod spec. Um, I have a function that I want to iterate through all of the containers, and I want to be able to compare it, right? And if all is well, give me an okay. But if all is not well, tell me it's rejected. Our match policy will either give us an accept or reject that matches up our enum. But then I created a function here and I call it, what is it, uh, pod at or under limit, right? And right now I'm just setting this to true. It's, if I ran it, if I deployed it, it'll return true. But we need to test it and make sure it's gonna do what we need it to do. And to do that, this is the test for it, right? Now, we're using the uh, open API, and that gives us the ability to look at what that uh, particular uh, pod looks like, and we iterate through there, and we go down to what we, we care about. And for this example, for this demo, it's the limit. And I set that here in the test, and I'm looking for it to accept. Now, this is one of many tests. You should always have a negative, uh, and test the negative, I can put another value in there and it should bomb and I should, instead of looking for accept, I should look for rejected, right? And this is one way of testing your code as you're writing a policy, right? But there's three ways we're gonna test it and this is the first one. And so when you're writing your test, make sure you have a positive, a negative, and then try to squeeze in an edge case here and there. So to build the policy, it's, we have to add a new target, and that's for WASM32. And so you have to do a rust up, target add, WASM32 hyphen unknown, hyphen unknown. I didn't, I didn't know this didn't come default, but you do. And then in the root directory of that project that you scaffold out using car, uh, car, cargo build, you just have to do a make build. Now I'm gonna want to warn you that it's gonna run format and you're gonna have a lot of issues. It's gonna run tests. You're gonna have a lot of issues because, well, the Rust analyzer that you use in that VS Code extension does not catch everything, but this will. What I recommend that you do is open up that make file and look at every one of those commands and run them individually and then fix your issues through there. It's usually a lot faster, a lot easier if you're not doing it as you're developing. But who does that as they're developing, right? Why would I care about formatting? I just care if it works. And when the, when the make build's done, you will have a file inside of target, wasm32 unknown, unknown, release, and we call this pod sizer, right? Because this is what it is, it's a pod sizer. I wanna make sure it's the right size. So we, we need to annotate the policy. You don't have to, but it's best practice, right? And it's just allowing to set a bunch of metadata around the policy that travels with it when you deploy it. Because one of the cool things about building a WASM policy for Kubewarden is that you can write it once, 
you can build it and you can deploy it to any cluster that you want to deploy it to. Doesn't matter. It's just a little binary, right? And that's what we use the KW, or KWCTL to do. We can annotate and in that directory, they have a template for that metadata, right? And you just set the meta path to that metadata and that output path to an annotated podsizer. Now, I said there's multiple ways for us to test this. And KWCTL has a run and you can test what this would look like if you were attempting to run this on a cluster, right? And that's the command that it comes with. So it's a really powerful CLI that I, I didn't realize how, how many bells and whistles like these guys packed in there, but it gives us the ability to test it. So I was not only having my unit test, but I was able to not, test against test data I have and set those particular limits right here and there and see what the results were gonna be. And it gives you a higher level of confidence when you are deploying your, your test, right? Because now your unit test passed and now I'm, I'm gonna run it against a test runner in a, key, a KWCTL to test it once again to make sure we see what it looks like. Now deploying. This is where it gets kind of interesting because there's f a few ways of deploying it and inside of this, we have a YAML file to deploy a cluster administration policy, right? And you can see here, it's what it looks like. But if you look at the module, I'm setting it up to a registry. Now, that's not the only way you can do it. You can do it by file system. You have to mount the file system and the uh, pod has to be able to have access to it for you to deploy it. <clears throat> or you can use it via HTTP, but the pod has to be able to talk out to that particular HTTP instance to do so, right? But the best practice is to use the registry, right? Because it's kind of how we want it to do it. So for this example, I actually pushed it to GitHub so I can pull it back down from GitHub and run it and deploy it. And this puts all the settings that I want this particular policy to have. So yes, you can use file system. Yes, you can use HTTP, but it's recommended to use it through a registry because that's the best practice of having this, having Coop Warden, right? Is that you're getting everything from a registry. You know where it's coming from. It's not willy nilly here and there. Now, in here, we have a handful of information, but in the settings, we have CPU limit, and I set that limit. 1.0, and I want to make sure that nothing exceeds that. Now, with the Open API, it does it does do a a check against what the values are that someone passes in, right? So if your pod doesn't match up to what that is, that's an issue. Now, for our demo, I didn't really validate that, right? I didn't go and make sure that it was, you know, 100m versus, you know. 1.0 or whatever it might be. I did not do any you know, regular, regular expression to validate that because it's just a demo. So you see it, you're like, well, this might bomb out. It might. But when users put the particular input, let them put the, we kind of let them put their input. If they want it to bomb, then it should bomb. And then from there, you, sh you can be able to see it, right? You can apply that a particular um, YAML and it will create that policy for you up there. But to test it, all you really have to do is just run apply and test a pod with more than one of that CPU. Now, I'm gonna stop for a moment. I'm gonna switch machines. Because there should be a demo. Give this a moment to come up. And you should be seeing my screen. Now, this is really tiny, so I wanna try to spruce it up here. And that should be big enough, right? Here is that pod sizer. Here's my code. Here is all of the, 
everything in there to use, but you're seeing a terminal and that doesn't, that doesn't look good, right? So we'll walk through it, just give you kind of an example of what this looks like. A handful of scaffolding here that we have. There's the policy response enum that I talked about. Here's our validation all in there. But I start peppering some logging, right? Because when something goes wrong, we want to make sure we can see it and it's good. So I added that. And then here's that iteration that we're going through, right? Iterate through all these containers. Make sure that every container in that, in that pod YAML or deployment is matched up to those settings. And if everything's good, I'll give you an OK. But if one's bad, I bomb out. And you're like, that's not really a good use case. But again, it's a demo, right? Some more logging, because that's always important. And then the most important part, a ton of tests. But if we go to here, I have my pod sizer. And let's, I have a couple pods YAML files in here. If I just show you what these look like. I got one that's uh, one CPU. And I got the other one. That's two. Hmm, no, it's one. I don't like that. Let's fix that real quick. Let's go to test data. Pod YAML two. Uh, let's make sure we let's give it more than two. Let's give it. Let's just give it two, right? Because it's called two. Save it. Let's go back to the. the All right. So KW or Kube CTL. Uh, let's get pods. I'll see all of them. Let's just see if it's there. As you can see, I have my cert manager. I have Kube board running. I have nothing in the default main namespace. But let's just see what that looks like, and we'll do it from this aspect of things. Too small for you guys? Tough crowd. It's pretty tiny. I know. Better? I know the people at home are probably telling me, they're just like, I can't see it on this iPhone. It's just too small. All right. So let's actually, let's, let's try to deploy something real quick. So let's go K or CTL, apply, let's go found, PLG one. And if we go over, oh, it's created. Let's look at that. She's pending. She's looking at it. She's thinking. Give her a moment. And if you guys don't know what this is, this is K9S. It's a really awesome little tool, especially when you're doing anything with a cluster. As we're giving this now, mind you, this is a old old laptop, and it's it is running Rancher Desktop as my uh, Kubernetes, so it's going to take a fat minute here. But as that's running, let's try the second one. Let's see what it looks like. Oh, nope. It gave me a rejected error. And so now I know something, something, went, something went awry. Something went wrong. And let's see what that looks like. And this thing is really heating up over here. She's, she's on full blast. I see my cluster is now reaching its limit. And I'll talk about that because this machine is really small. It's actually a, a really under under underclock machine, so it's going to be a little slow. So I apologize.
All right, so she's thinking about it. But if we go over to all of our instances and we go to our policy server and we wait for the logs and give it a minute, in here, all of those uh, logging functions that I put in there will show up here. Now, obviously, because it's the demo gods are not blessing me today, um, you're not seeing them just yet, but everything in here, you should see the rejection listed here and above. And I guess it's just, it's an underpowered machine and I apologize. But with that logging that we have, we have the ability to go see what happened for that. And the, the policy server gives us all of that as we go. And K9S is really telling me that my CPU levels right now are way too low. And that's unfortunate. So that being said, I want to move back over and I want to talk about why I kind of wanted to do this slightly different. So I want to unplug this, let it die here, trying to create that pod. I'll come back to this. Generally, when you come to a conference, you go, hey, this guy's going to talk about something, this guy or gal, this individual is going to talk about something, and I'm going to learn something and take it from there. I'll give it a minute so you guys can see my screen. But I wanted to make this kind of different. So I want to give almost next steps, right? Something to take away from what you learned here. And because you might not have learned enough. So if you want, I could put it all on, on GitHub. Steps by step instructions, and it's github.com slash Robert Cirk, Rust Lab, Wasm. You can go out there and pull this down and follow the README files. I actually have uh, seven of them in there that you can follow, and it's step by step instructions on creating a policy. And to do that, you can just download it and run the policy yourself. Now, that being said, to test it, you're going to need to, pu to publish it to a particular repository. So for that, I actually published it twice right down there. There's no difference, actually a difference in the syntax. But you can go out there and run this you know, demo yourself, Podsizer. The code's there. You can build it, or you can just pull it and just push it through your Kubernetes cluster running Kubewarden and test it out. So I kind of did it a little differently because I gave you kind of homework. If you wanted to do it, you can. If you want to play hooky. By all means, do so. And I'm going to turn it over to questions, comments, concerns. Really, nobody. Go ahead. Can you actually? I think you got to go talk to the mic so other people can hear it because we're live streaming. So there's individuals at home or at the office. Yeah, I, I may lost somewhere. I saw you wrote the rule with um, uh, uh, policy with uh, Rust and then run in Kubernetes, which is a Go environment. Like, uh, how do you feel like uh, these two languages work together? Wait, wait, wait. Can you repeat the question? Uh, you, you write uh, the, the policy with uh, the Rust mm -hmm. and then running in Kubernetes, the, the Go language environment. So how do you feel like uh, how the like uh, work with each other like uh, well that's the kind of that's kind of that's a great question and actually it gives me the ability to kind of jump back um rust is the language i chose to do this in oh. but kubewarden supports go i go back here it supports go and you can use tiny go to compile into into wasm oh. right so okay. you, you have that ability now i know net has mono but we do not have an sdk but we do have a go sdk right and so Kubewarden's documentation will go through and show you that. You can use Rego as well. So if you have OPA existing, you can bring those policies over. I just chose Rust because it's, I don't want to say it's the latest hotness, but it was, it's, it's been a language I wanted to you know, put a lot more focus on in 2022. And it's gave me an opportunity to kind of jumpstart on that. But we could have done the same thing in Go with relative ease, but the compiler is going to be using tiny Go. And our SDK and the documentation for that will go through and, and go into detail about that. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Now, one last slide, and I will let you guys go. 
additional resources. I, again, make the, my, P, this is a PDF. If you go on my GitHub page that I, I put all this at, you can go down and download it. Um, I have documentation links for the docs, Kubewarden, Rust, Rancher Desktop, and the reason why is it's just a, an easy, instant Kubernetes on your desktop. It runs on Linux, you saw it right then and there. It runs on Mac and Windows. Uh, I, I said Windows so no one get upset, please. I know we're at a Linux conference. Um, there's also a link to the community site where I work, right? And that's where community members can come through, assist you with questions, comments, and concerns. And it's anything to do with the Rancher Susan Rancher community. So if you can't find me on Twitter, you can find me with on the community site. So that's community.susa.com. And we also have a Rancher Labs Slack channel and that I'm always in answering questions and helping out in the community as well, all right? And if there's no other questions, I want to thank everybody. And for you guys at home, thank you. I appreciate you listening here on a Saturday, on you know, football Saturday. So thank you. All right, our next talk is in about 30 minutes and about it's about AI and cloud infrastructure. Um, so you got about 30 minutes from now. Uh, reminder, there's still raffle, raffle tickets for sale. And if you haven't picked up your t-shirt, you need to do so.